Welcome back to Time Series Analysis. Now we've gone to the seventh lecture where the focus will be on estimation of parameters in dynamic models. In the past presentations, we just used a function called RIMA, but now we kind of get to know what happens underneath the, sh <coughs> the hood there. And we'll also co use quite a few examples in R just to show differences and how to do things. The most important place to start is to go back to the so-called golden table for identifying models. Remember, if you have a pure autoregressive model then of order p, then the partial autocollation function will be equal to zero when k for, for lags greater than p. And reverse for the moving average model where the autocollation function will be zero when k is greater than q. And that also means if you have a combined model with both an autoregressive and moving average, as in an armor model, then you should expect to see exponential behavior both in ACF and PACF. So whenever you see that, you know that you're in for a model that has two parts. Now, what we looked at in the past is how to specify a potential appropriate model structure for being uh, autoregressive or moving average or AMA or RIMA. We won't talk too much about RIMA today, but what we'll say is that we'll now assume that we know the orders of P, D, and Q. Now the task is how do we find the appropriate parameters? So in the book, Time Series Analysis book by Henrik Madsen, we have a lot of different methods. We have the moment estimates that we won't spend much time on, but we'll get back to that. Then we have the least squares estimates that we have used a lot of time on already, and we will continue doing that. Prediction errors, both conditioning and unconditioned. And then maximum likelihood, which is, you can say, my preferred. So we'll save the best for last. As an example, we'll start with here. We look at a financial time series here, and what we discussed from previous is a we could want to estimate an AR2 model to fit this. Now we just have to select the two coefficients, A1 and A2, so that we s minimize the sum of squared prediction errors. And notice here that we have A1 and A2 being positive on the right hand side of the equal sign. So it's not the definition in the book, but it's often used as well. So what we could do is we'll just use the fine notation where we have them as negative coefficients when on the right-hand side. So that's how we want to build the model. Now, when we look at that, what we have is a number of observations from y1 to yn. And then what we can do, we have the establish a prediction based on the previous observations, and therefore we can look at the prediction error, epsilon t plus 1 given t, so that's the yt plus 1 observation minus the prediction that we have out here. So that's what we have to do. And then we just have to do that for all of the errors. So we can do that for all the time points, starting from time 3, because for time 2 and time 1, we don't have observations 0 and minus 1. Now, when we look at this whole thing, why don't we do this in a smarter way? We can write it up in a matrix formulation. So we have the usual, we have the observations, we have the parameters, and we have the epsilons. But now the design matrix here is a little bit more, it's a little bit different from what we've typically done, because now we have the past observations in each, the two previous observations in each row as the two columns in the design matrix. So that's the main difference compared to what we've done each before. And I guess when I show this notation here, well, you should all know how to solve this to find the set of parameters theta, that being phi 1 and phi 2. Notice that I put a minus in front of all the observations here to comply with the default definition in the book. So the solution, as you probably remember, is that an estimate of theta hat 
is x transpose x inverse x transpose y. With these definitions here, that also means that we have the variance of the estimator asymptotically is given an estimate of sigma epsilon squared, then we just have to multiply that with x transpose x inverse. So that's the precision that we have there. This is the least squares estima estimator because that's what we solved up here. But we also look at one step prediction errors. So it's also in the class of prediction error methods. And what we should notice is that the first observation we use here is y3. So we are conditioning on the first two. So therefore, it's also a conditioning method. So in the groups that we had in the beginning, this actually qualifies for tree of ticks. But how to generalize this to an ARP model? Think of it for a while, press pause, and then we can continue. So what we have to do is to go for an ARP model is to say then we need p columns in here. That means that we we'll have yp in the first column here, the first element here. That means the first observation we can use is yp plus 1. So we have n minus p observations that we can use for an ARP model. Fine. Now, just as a very small example, in our, with some R code here, we have, in this case, just six observations. So n becomes six. Then we pick, we want to fit the a an AR2 model. So we say that observation three to n, th that is my vector of observations. We have them here. And then we create our design matrix as those two columns here. Knows how things are shifted around here. And then we solve it in the usual way by solving the normal equation. Relative to what we did before, namely to say, oh, theta hat equals x transpose x inverse x transpose y. Then I do it in a numerically more stable way to solve this instead. So I calculate x transpose x here, and then I solve that with respect to theta here equals x transpose y. So that's using the normal equation instead, which is, you can say, on the form of a matrix times a vector that we want to estimate, let's call it x, equals another vector of coefficients. So that's a more robust way of doing it numerically. And then we get an estimate of the two parameters that we're wanting. So, so far, so good. That was, you can say, the least square method, and it works fine when you have a pure autoregressive model. When you have a moving average part in the model as well, so in the general model where you have a polynomial over here as well in theta, polynomial in B, the backward shift operator, then we have to do something different. We can again have the AR part. Now, typically we co label the parameters in the AR part for phi's and the parameters in the moving average part for thetas. Now, what I will do now is I will combine all these parameters, both the phi's and the theta, in one parameter vector, and I'll still call it theta, because when we do linear regression, that's all most typically the name for our parameters. And then I will introduce one more detail, being yt containing all the observations as a vector, containing all the observations up to time t. So yt contains observation from yt down back to y1. Now, what we want to do in a maximum likelihood is we want to look at the joint probability distribution function for all the observations given the parameters, being thetas and being sigma epsilon squared, which we'll derive from that. 
So we look at the joint probability distribution for this, and then we want to maximize the likelihood of observing the data by choosing the right set of optimal set of parameters. The challenge here is when we have many observations, this is a big job. So what we will look at is, first of all, we assume in the process that the errors are IID, so they are independent, identically distributed. That means when you are at a certain point in time, say time n here, the error at time n does not depend on anything that was observed prior to time n. So the random variable yn, given all the previous observations, only contains epsilon n as a random component. So that means when epsilon n is white noise, then we can take the density, the joint density, and split it in a univariate density for yn, given all the previous observations, the parameters, and multiply that by the density, the joint distribution of all the previous observations. So having done that, once we get a univariate times a multivariate distribution here, but this multivariate distribution has the same feature because y n minus 1 is independent, or except, I mean, the dependence is on the previous y's from that one has the same structure. So what we can do is that we can repeat the argument and have the likelihood written as a product of all the densities of y n given all the previous, uh, sorry, y t, given all the previous y's and the parameters from t equal p plus 1 till n. And why this? Well, that's because, as we saw earlier on, for the AR2 process, we need two parameters in order to, two observations to predict the first observation in that sense. So we need to look at the density of the first p observations as, long, uh, as it all, uh, on its own. So we have the joint distribution here, where the likelihood can be written as a product, and then the last bit. Often you have many observations. That means that you have much more information here than out there. So what we did in the previous case with the AR2 model is, as I said, we conditioned on the first two observations. That is effectively to say we condition on y knowing yp. So to take those for granted. So that's one thing. Another thing here, which is that when you look at the likelihood, often you may not work with the likelihood, but the log likelihood. And one of the reasons for that is this product here of a lot of densities, these densities will in general be small numbers. Most will be less than one. So we have a product of many numbers that are small, and you keep multiplying them all together, you may have the miracle underflow. So if you do the logarithm of this instead, the product becomes a sum and everything behaves nicer. And if you want to maximize the likelihood, well, since the logarithm is a monotone increasing function, you can still maximize the li log likelihood and you get to the same maximum. So that's one thing we'll get back to a little bit later. It also has some other nice statistical features, but that's to some extent outside the scope of this course. But what we will do is we'll consider the conditional likelihood function thereby excluding the information from the first p observations as we had on the previous slide. So we'll get almost the same ex estimates as we get by using exact like maximum likelihood. And you can see whenever you have a small sample, of course there will be a bigger difference than if you have a larger sample. And the default in the R function of RIMA is to actually do the exact likelihood. You can run the process backwards and thereby you can get information about the first two observations as well. But that's more technical. I think in most purposes, it's sufficiently fine to just run the filter forward and thereby get the conditional likelihood function. 
But what we have to do is we have to estimate, we have to evaluate this likelihood in order to say something about it. So we need to find the conditional densities given our model. So what we discussed before is that, well, the random variable yt given all the previous observations, that's the one-step forecast. We did that for the AR2 model or in any AR model. So, and we also know that the variance of that one-step prediction is sigma epsilon square. It's quite nice to always have sigma epsilon square when you look at one step. If you were to look at, say, multi-step behavior, then you would not just have this, but you would also have an impact from parameters, and all of a sudden, the optimization problem in the process will be nonlinear. So, it's good to focus on one-step prediction errors. Within this course, we will focus on white noise being from Gaussian processes. So the density of yt given all the previous observations and the parameters will be a normal density of the normal distribution. So we have the prediction error squared in here, known by two times the variance. And if we then look at the likelihood well, that's the same thing, but for yn, we just have to multiply all these together for each of the observations. Note the n minus p here because we condition on the first two. And what we get in here, well, the multiplication of the exponentials is the sum of the powers in there, so we get a sum of all the epsilon squared in here from t equals p plus 1 to n. So when we want to maximize the likelihood, then the sigma epsilon out here is a derived parameter. What we really care about is the theta in there. So to maximize this, we have a minus in here. Then we need to minimize what we have inside here, which basically means that we have to minimize the least sum of least squares. Or sum of squares, sorry. So we are back to having the same optimization problem as before. However, that we now condition that we use a Gaussian distribution. So basically repeating that, what we want to minimize is the sum of squared errors, once the prediction errors. What we want to minimize is the sum of one square prediction errors. And if we differentiate the full expression from the likelihood from the previous page with respect to sigma epsilon square, then we can also find the maximum likelihood estimate of sigma epsilon, and we find it to be the usual estimate, the sum of epsilon squared divided by n minus p, which is the number of elements in the sum. So it's not the n minus p as in p being the number of parameters that we're subtracting from the decrease of freedom, but it's because we only have n minus p element in the sum for s theta. This estimator is as asymptotically unbiased, asymptotically because we did actually estimate some parameters that we do not correct for. It's also efficient, and the covariance matrix is the same as we saw previously, namely with the inverse Hessian, being the second order partial derivatives of s theta around the minimum. So everything is pretty much behaving the same way as it did in the case for the linear regression models. We just have a little bit more challenges in evaluating this. So that's what we get to now. So what we have to do is to make one-step predictions. So we just write the whole thing up. Now the challenge is how to get started, because we don't know all these epsilons out here. We said that, well, we need to have, we can only have p plus 1 as the first part here, because then we can evaluate the autoregressive part. But the moving average part here is different. So how do we get about this? Well, what we do is just to say that all those that have epsilon p and before then, we set those to zero. So again, we condition the first epsilons, the first p epsilons 
to be zero, that means you condition on the observations being the true values. Now, if we have that, then we can go and find y p plus 1 given p as the autogressive part that we know. And we can also evaluate the moving average part here, which starts out to be 0. There's no contribution, because we assume that they're 0. Now, given that, one-step prediction here, we can get epsilon p plus 1 and find that as y p plus 1 minus y hat p plus 1 given p. And thereby, whenever we want to continue in the chain here, then for each step we get, we get an epsilon here that is different from zero. And we just need q steps, and then we are having all epsilons that are different from zero. So in the beginning of the series, when doing looking at all the prediction errors, then we have an influence from not knowing what happens before the beginning of time. But if you have many observations, the impact of that is fairly small. And in general, you have to do numerical optimization, except for the pure uh, autoregressive models, to find the parameters that minimize the sum of square prediction errors. One example, plotting the, in this case, log likelihood for an armor model where the AR parameter is minus 0.7, and the moving average part is minus 0.4, which means when I simulate it in R, where the convention for the AR part is different, I have a positive 0.7 here, and I still have minus 0.4 here. I simulated 500 realization, and then I calculated for a range of different parameters for the AR part phi, and for the Moving average part theta, I calculated what is the likelihood. And then I kind of cut off the least interesting parts out here to find in here. So the optimal is the circle here, and the true value is the small plus that is down here. But what you can see here as well is that we don't have nice circles around here. We have something that is elongated. So that also means that the two estimates that we have are actually correlated because we can approximate it with an ellipsoid. At least if it was truly normal, it was an ellipsoid. And this is not too far away from being an ellipsoid, but we will have cases where you have bounds on parameters saying that this parameter cannot be negative, for instance. And then using the curvature around the optimal and then say, well, how far can I go out? To use that as a confidence interval for parameter is not always meaningful if it includes negative values. But that's kind of outside the scope. But there's another cause where you look more into using likelihood. And you can do profile likelihood intervals where you kind of take care of that. <coughs> 